Rebel Moon reviews are out, and they're about as impressed with it as I was with the trailer. I found her. Scargiver. All I'm saying is if you want to act as an action hero, you should at least be able to beat me up. There are limits to how all of us can suspend our disbelief. You stupid woman with your weird child. But as the reviews poured in, well, it wasn't good news starting at 9%, rose to 14, and has now settled at 23% from the critics. Unless you click top critics, where it's still at zero. And I've heard arguments that the critics just don't like Zack Snyder, but they do like this. <laughs> Somebody who's strong, independent, and alone, taking down the patriarchy one skull at a time. So the results still surprise me, but there is one shining light in the darkness, and that is the audience score coming in at 72, or at least you'd think so. You see, the movie isn't out yet, and so the audience score comes solely from people who went to the cinema to watch a Netflix movie. This is going to be Zack Snyder fans, the most passionate of fan base. Tell it to the judge. It, the judge is the public. These are going to be the people that really like his movies and were desperate to see it, and so found some rare advanced screening on display. In other words, that's going to be the high watermark from his fans. I can't imagine as it gets released to people that like his movies less, that the score is going to go up. But the most interesting part between the two critic scores is actually how much they agree on things. So we've got quality production values with scatterbrained, incoherent storytelling. They've got sort of gave it four and a half stars, says, it's a two-part movie, and part one serves to build the characters, and we will start the narrative in the second part. Dreams really can come true. It's beautiful, expertly designed, enjoyable to watch, but leaves little lasting impression. That actually sounds like an incredible review. Still got rotten. The movie feels like a million isolated storyboards without a single thing welding them together. Fantastic film, raw action, pure filmmaking. But the storytelling is difficult to say it is the best. We have to prepare for the director's cut. This movie's two hours, 14 minutes long. Oh, I just don't have the time to actually put a story in my movie. <laughs> I was too busy doing this. Mind you, when you look at the length of his other movies, this is positively succinct. But if you want one of the strangest reviews, it's this one. There's something insidious about a bad movie that has a lot of bonkers stuff in it. In the words of Admiral Akbar, it's a trap. Do you understand how insane you sound when you say that? Oh no, it's a really bad movie, but it's just got a load of entertaining stuff in it to trick me into thinking it's good. Look, love, if you like the movie, you can just say it. If there's a load of good stuff in a movie that can actually trap you into liking it, then that's a good movie. As the only definition of good and bad is whether you like it or not. But as in any of these videos, my favourite thing is going through the bad reviews and finding as many insults as possible. I love a good insult, especially one with an original bite to it. But there are some sites where the entertainment is less about the thing they're talking about and more about the website that's saying it. That is how we end up looking at Polygon. Everyone but the release the Snyder Cut fanboys would be better off immediately ejecting this turgid whimper. The very fact that they know the hashtag means that this one is going to be biased. If you make it through Rebel Moon, you'll be greeted with the five most horrifying words in the English language. Director of photography, Zack Snyder. I'd say who hurt you, but it seems like Zack Snyder did. This is the first paragraph and you're opening with, I just don't like the bloke. I don't care about his movie. I don't like the bloke. What did he do? Leave for a pint of milk when you were a kid or something? Mediocre at best. Is terrified that one day he'll be discovered as the aging, talentless hack that he really is. After his studio career of machismo accepted I did have to look that up because I'm like, there's no way that's a word. It turns out, yes, it is. I just don't have enough mental illnesses to learn it. Strong or aggressive masculine pride. In other words, it's a compliment he just doesn't know he's giving. It would be great to report that the first installment was a bold new sci-fi epic on the scene. I mean, would it really? Considering you hate the bloke and you hate anything that has testosterone, did you really enter this movie going, I wish this would be good? I'll admit, I went into my screening with a bit of masochistic glee. <laughs> Okay, maybe the people said the critics don't like Snyder, uh, they had a point. But I never expected them to be this open about it. Although maybe I did, because, you know, Polygon. It's hardly a bastion of journalistic integrity, is it? Dad issues. Dad, Dad, Dad issues. Dad issues. <laughs> I'm not immune to the charms of the polarizing auteur. For all his faults, are you going to say any of them? Oh, his polarizing. He's got many faults, I'm just not going to give any evidence for any. It wasn't outside the realm of possibility that he could have delivered something good. High praise there from Polygon. The plot centers on a farm girl with a mysterious past. Oh, this is an original piece of art, I can tell you. She's a genetically engineered soldier who just wants to grill. <laughs> 
we're gonna have to fight. Then there's a typical stuffed shirt space socialist called Atticus Noble. He's the type of mincing henchman. How much mincing is he doing, really? Those two words really don't go together. Who whispers you're free to a hostage just before stabbing them in the neck? You know, bad guy stuff. So then we spend the movie assembling people, and by the time we've actually got the gang together, the runtime's already exhausted. Can you imagine if we had Ocean's Eleven and it was just collecting people, and then went, ah, we'll rob it next week? We gotta be smart about this. I can understand why people might be a bit angry, especially if you want a director's cut which has extra footage to you just gathering people together. And then we get a load of comments which is very similar to pretty much every review, even a lot of the good ones. It's just generic. Conjures up memories of other IPs. Lots of action, and then we move from slow motion to even slower motion. Then he's really annoyed because a gay alien dies. That's a shocking bit of phobia. It's like, is it? Is it really? Look, you'll find it a lot easier to review movies if you don't think that people represent you. He didn't shoot you in the back of the head. Just because someone has a characteristic doesn't mean they're immune to karma. Doesn't mean that people are scared of them. It's a bummer to have to dunk so hard on a brand new piece of fantasy. But that doesn't make any sense. Was it? It really doesn't feel like you had such a hard time. Oh, I, I regret having to criticize this movie. When you started it saying that Zack Snyder directed something was one of the five most horrifying words in the English language, said you hated testosterone, and went into the movie with masochistic glee. You can't end that with, oh, I wish I liked it though. What fresh hell awaits us in part two? Child of Fire may not be his worst film, but thanks to those five scary words, this man is terrified when he sees Zack Snyder's name. It's also his worst looking. The fact that he put his name in the credits for this guy ruined the entire movie. He got paid to write that. It's like my perfect job. But yes, bias critics definitely exist. I think we've proven that part. But if you do have bias critics versus his most passionate fans, and it's still a number somewhere between 22 and 72% think it's above average. How much of a compliment is that really? <laughs> because this is a movie where the description has just said, we gather the gang together and it ends. Even the reviews that like it says the first half is just putting the characters together and then it'll start the story in the second part. <laughs> and we've got Zack Snyder himself promising a three hours director cut of the critically trashed Rebel Moon. You've got two hours 15 of just putting people together and he wants to make it longer. You're gonna make me beg, aren't you? How much more is there to add to a movie that doesn't have a plot in the first place? I'd love to know. Zack, do you think the movie would be better if we just started at part two? The gang's already together and we've just started where the story begins. It seems like a better idea to me. I mean, you could still have plenty of this. Unimaginably weedy person beats up five men. I'm surprised that didn't appeal to Polygon, actually. It's not exactly machismo, is it? But as this currently holds the second worst tomatoes rating of his career, and it arrives with disastrous review scores, Screen Rant asks, is it that bad though? Eight big takeaways from the reviews. And Screen Rant, as always, with the in-depth technical analysis, it feels like Star Wars. Yeah, I think that's the point, mate. Style over substance, mostly just setup, mishandles those serious topics. Like it's troubling portrayal of the alphabet. Despite its notable inclusion of a protagonist, still not enough from the independent. We'll definitely get back to that one later. You have to include these people. Okay, we'll hire those people. Wait, wait. You can't do anything to them in the story, though. They've got to be good, perfect angels. Otherwise, we'll complain. Start accusing you of lots of slurs. It's almost like pandering just causes you more problems, isn't it, really? You're pure evil. And you're just another man taking credit for a woman's work. Something Disney's learning about in recent times. But hey, it's got a great cast. It's not their fault it was written like trash. It's more proof of concept than a story. So obsessed with world building, it eclipses the story itself. Self. And that's always going to be a problem when you build out a new universe. You have to be very careful to not just try and want to do everything at once. Otherwise, you probably need a three hour movie that you still don't put a story in. I've been re watching Farscape recently, and what that does, it just picks a bloke, puts him in a new universe, and then slowly, over time, he views all of this new universe. That's the way you do it. You don't jump all over the universe and try and set everything up all at the same time. There's a theme here, by the way. A little bit. And this is a movie, not a TV series, so you have to be really succinct in what you're doing. The action scenes are great though. Probably explains a lot of the audience scores. I am partial to a good action scene myself. But it has glaring omissions, promising various different cuts, may have solved some of the problems with pacing issues and shallow characterization. Shallow characterization would definitely be a massive problem with this movie, considering that's all the movie seems to be. <laughs> you have the characters in action without a story. How can you mess up the characters? And why is it called an ugly, unforgivable, dull, and self-serious? 
serious mess when everyone else has said it's beautiful. <laughs> I'm not sure this movie can be considered complete at all, as it's a 134 minute film that really only covers getting the gang together. You're showing off. Maybe a little. I'm sorry, but that sounds awful. One of the issues with a multi-part film, something like Lord of the Rings, is that yeah, you've got three movies and a full plot across all of those three movies, but each film has its own story that comes to a satisfying conclusion at the end of every movie. That is what is required for a multi-part movie. It's not required in a TV series where you're watching the next part next week, but a movie should be self-contained even if there are things that hold over to the next bit. This just seems like an introduction. It's a setup. It's the start of a movie. And if you need a second half in order to actually make the first half do anything, I can understand why people don't like it and even the most passionate of people only give it a 72. Because an introduction to a movie as a movie doesn't sound very satisfying to me. Most movies knock out the introduction in the first half an hour, yes. I, I wish this one did. There's still time for him to add character development to his ragtag band of cardboard cutouts. And if you want a cardboard cutout, well, just watch the trailer. I found her. Scargiver. Random Disney character number three, please, is all I see from that trailer of her. <laughs> By the end credits, expecting anyone to come back and find out in the second half is asking a lot. Rebel Moon risks being subsumed by its own self-importance. The second half will doubtless tie up various loose threads left frustratingly dangling. You don't want people to finish your movie and be frustrated. That's not an emotional impact you want on an audience, but fans of Snyder won't be left wanting. I think that's a compliment, although it is very specific. Like, this'll piss most people off, but if you like being pissed off, you'll enjoy it. <laughs> the first installment of Rebel Moon plays like the first two acts of a movie, or perhaps more truly as haphazardly assembled series of episodes. That's actually interesting, because this is from Netflix. You have to wonder if this was ever thought of as a TV series rather than two movies, which given the setup and the length of time they want to put into each movie, probably would have done better as a series. And in a series, you have so much more time to build out a brand new universe as you can show each bit individually in each episode and lead people into it and get steadily more complex, rather than a movie where it seems like everyone's just jumping all over the place, desperately trying to show everything all at once in one movie. I stand against hate. Variety thinks it's just another derivative thing that knocks off various other IPs. It's like, okay. Literally every new IP is just whatever the author knows put together in a new form. Everything is derivative of something. The difference is you're supposed to put it together to make something new and original and unique on its own, whereas Snyder decided to base his universe around someone who's strong independent and can do it all herself. The industry talks a lot about identity, identity, identity. Maybe not building your movie around 2023 would have been a good idea. It's Star Wars meets Guardians of the Galaxy meets Lord of the Rings meets Black Panther. I'm sorry, what? That really is a you'd have to see it to understand it kind of comment. I don't even know how you merge those four movies together. I just really hope you don't mean lightsabers meets bad comedy meets epic fantasy with advanced technology, which would be the most surface level analogy you could give. <laughs> all smelted down and reduced to a highly edible source of over-familiar tropes. Minus any semblance of a sense of humour. Actually, I think that's a good thing. Because if we're referencing Guardians of the Galaxy, please, for the love of everything, leave out the humour. Sci-fi universes can exist without people telling jokes that aren't funny. We're just a joke to you. Not so funny now, are we? Movies this derivative, in my view, are inherently uncool. Dude, who cares about what's cool? Are you 12? We get half the review down before he stops talking about how it's Star Wars and actually starts talking about the movie itself. But some farmers have their grain stolen, and so she travels the universe gathering together a fellowship of rebel fighters. Oh, there's the Lord of the Rings. The movie is episodic in the extreme. Again, makes you wonder if it was a series to begin with. Oh look, we've travelled to a planet and got a person. Next week we'll travel to a different planet and get a new person. Actually sounds like it could have been made into a good TV series. Why are we obsessed with movies? A six hour movie could have been a short series, and you could have shown it weekly all in one go rather than pissing people off because you end your movie just gathering some people together. Snyder stages it all on an impressively lavish scale with all the CGI of $166 million. I think at this point the question is, are people fed up with CGI sprawl? <laughs> Rebel Moon is eminently watchable, but it's a movie built entirely of spare parts that it may, in the end, be for Snyder cultists only. Variety, you were doing so well right up until you were like, oh, also have a problem with Snyder, do you? Although you'd have to say, looking at the review scores, maybe they've got a point. The movie is based around one question. What if Star Wars was crossed with the Seven Samurai? With nothing beyond that. It was originally pitched to Lucasfilm as a Star Wars project, and now he's done it on his own. Which is why it doesn't make much sense that Variety spent half of their review talking about Star Wars. 
films. The movie is a lot less fun than Star Wars. It's more adolescent. It's not more complex. The goodies are straightforward goodies and the baddies are straightforward baddies. Good? And you can usually tell that by how attractive they are. Also, good. I know Hollywood loves to play in the grey. Try and dismantle and deconstruct the idea of morality. Oh, there isn't just good acts. No, there's actually a whole range of moralities that you can choose from. And if I disagree with you about what's good, my opinion is just as valid as yours. We can all be good people even when I'm evil. Yeah, no. What, what I care about is the, the reality of goodness, not the perception of it. No, it turns out that good guys are good guys and bad guys are bad guys. And the whole idea of grey morality is simply people trying to carve out an exception for themselves so that they can do evil but signal as virtuous. And what I see all over the place is people who care about looking good while doing evil. If anything, I think straightforward morality in a movie is a good thing. Turns out what people want to see are the bad guys getting what they deserve. That would just be a little bit of an uncomfortable topic for evil people. Their heroine is Cora, a soldier who defected from the realm. Okay, she's a soldier, but why can she do this? <laughs> I really hope she's like genetically engineered superhuman or something. Or that all the men in the universe just get force-fed avocados. Stasner is a Tarak, a Conan the Barbarian lookalike who refuses to wear a shirt. Which makes a lot of sense when you want the other half of the population to watch. Who's not gonna be watching for the main character. I'm here to make you an offer, to give you a chance at redemption. Nor will anyone else, actually. One of the film's flaws is that once Korra got her ragtag gang together, they don't do or say anything significant. It's a waste. Again, the first film is an intro to the second movie. That's not good storytelling. I'm sure Zack thinks that no, this is a one movie, it's just split in two halves. But nobody is satisfied by the introduction to the good bit, assuming it's good. There's a reason why in Ocean's Eleven they had to rob the place at the end. Nobody has a chance to demonstrate their abilities or personality. Nothing exciting happens. No challenges to meet, no obstacles to overcome, no Death Stars to destroy. Despite the grandiosity of the film's tone, the story turns out to be disappointingly minor. And as I said at the start, even in the positive reviews from the audience, they agree. Part one builds the characters. The story may start in a second part. So you could say that something strangely endearing about the movie, the action could be great, but if you don't wrap that up with a satisfying conclusion, people will leave the movie frustrated and unfulfilled, and that's going to lead to bad reviews, regardless of how they feel about Snyder. It's the principle of the thing. That's why in this review, they're like, oh no, this is actually amazing. But it's all about the story behind how the movie got made, rather than than the film itself not being up to much. So while you can argue that some of the critics have an axe to grind with Snyder, the BBC doesn't seem to be one of them considering how heartwarming they think his actual real life story is with the movie. And these are points that get repeated all over the place. It's the same topics coming up time and time again. Visual splendor meets narrative disarray, largely because there isn't one. Struggles under the weight of its own aspirations. You have to gather up a diverse group of warriors. The sets, costumes, visual effects are all crafted with an almost obsessive precision. But the storytelling is linear and tediously predictable. The characters lack depth, undergo little development, lacks coherence. But you know, maybe the second part will actually introduce a story. Have you lost your reptilian ass mind? It's a borderline incoherent shambles, a drag, an expensive mess, and is more Star Wars for people who think those movies are too political. I'm sorry, Mr. Independent, but you'd not like the movie because it doesn't push your ideas enough. That's a strange critique. As they gather the gang together, they visit each planet only to yell about revenge and honor or defeat a monster in order to convince them to join the squad. This was a TV series. Each week you go to a planet, meet a person, solve their problem and they join your squad. That works for TV, not movies. There's a lot here that could be solved with an R-rated longer cut, but why should audiences have to sit through two and a bit hour trailer for a second film that they've been pinky promised might be better later? And that's the thing I don't understand. You can understand with his previous movies, where things happen so he couldn't do his cut. But when he's making the movie himself, why are you being promised a longer cut later? Make the movie as the movie should be. Stop making it twice. You're literally giving us a movie where you're going, this isn't even how I want it to be. But you know, I'll do a bit of work and actually finish it later. I already have to put up with unfinished video games. I don't want movies that are early access. Here's the questionable choices. Take a walk. It handily avoids the pitfalls of appropriation by locating each character within a world largely suited to their own act as cultural heritage. This is a different universe. Why would I give a toss about the actor's cultural heritage? Lesson to the independent journalist here. It's not about you and no one cares about your life. We don't care what you would do because we don't care about your life whatsoever. But dun dun dun, this movie dares to have a world where someone might be <gasps> racist. 
No. Or where intimate violence could be used as a tool of war. Because that's never happened throughout all of history. I'm sorry, does the violent action movie not pander you to your fifis enough? Oh no, please somebody save me. Put up a trigger warning. It's the pair of anguish. It was used on women who had relations with the devil. And despite the film featuring a prominent actor who's not a zero or a one, it's also not the first time a supposed lair of degeneracy. What? Is it set in California? Has been depicted as explicitly queer coded. See the film 300? Been a while since I've seen 300, I have to say. But then again, 2006 was a better time where people were just told to shut up, you lunatic. We'd just laugh and humiliate people who came out with really bizarre points. The film's obligatory candor scene seems to feature the entire cast of cabaret loitering in the background. Are we supposed to be too distracted to notice? No, put it in the movie, mate. It was probably there for you to see. People aren't secretly hiding things in movies for you to work work out. There aren't secret hidden messages put in movies for you to rewind backwards and hear about the demons. People aren't insulting you in foreign alien languages that you just can't translate yet. The insults aren't hidden in the numbers. It was probably just put in there because that's what the alien world is like and unfortunately you just have a problem with it because you can't see yourself in it. Go ahead, get Fetch me some brown possum butter. Sprinkle it on my bum and make my gentle wind smell like cinnamon. No, the Rebel Moon reviews are particularly weird because there is definitely a group of them who just hate Snyder and they're very open about it. You do get the feeling that no matter what this film would be like, they would have given it a bad review. But the points that they do make are also backed up by people who seemingly don't care about Zack Snyder either way. And that's the camp I fit in. I don't really care about directors at all. I just judge a movie by a movie. Barely remember who directed what because I don't care. And for those people, they're bringing up the same problems, that this feels like an intro to the second movie, that the story will start in the second movie, that everyone goes around to different planets and gathers a group of people together who then don't do anything. That doesn't sound like a good movie to me. That sounds like a part one movie that doesn't understand how to make a movie, that you can't expect the audience to bear in mind this is a two-parter, folks, and so it's unfinished. You're the one who made the decision to split your thing in half, and so each half should be its own self-contained movie. You can continue the plot in the second one all you want, but that doesn't give you an excuse to make the first one not have a plot. It should be satisfying and fulfilling as its own thing. You shouldn't have to put part one in there. You could just make a movie series. And that's how this seems to be. The part one is there as an excuse. It's there so that if you complain, you go, oh, well, there's a second half. It'll solve all your issues. And it doesn't work with me. To make a film satisfying and fulfilling, you still have to do something in the first movie. They still have to achieve something or struggle, challenge. There's got to be a reason to watch it. Some kind of goal that they overcome. And in this, it really really doesn't seem like they are. Now I'm a big fan of action movies just for action movie sake, but even they overcome the bad guy at the end of it. But if you'd made the John Wick version of Ocean's Eleven and just stopped the movie after they got the gang together, I wouldn't have been a fan of that either. And that is where Rebel Moon seems to be. But hey, maybe it'll be better than Aquaman. They're both released on the same day and, uh, and just a few days before Christmas. Well, I think with this, whether you're a Snyder fan or not, it's gonna be interesting to see the fallout after it's released. But those are just my thoughts. What are yours? Let me know down in the comments below. Like the video, like the video, subscribe more videos like this in the future, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.